Well, good evening, dear friends, dear academic family. Um, I'm happy to welcome you to the lecture of this year, Open Lecture Series, which is organized by Faculty of Architecture of Estonian Academy of Arts and the lecture series, uh, series supported by Cultural Endowment of Estonia. And this fall, all lectures revolve around the issue of healing. In one way or another, uh, we've explored whether architecture as a process can be therapeutic and in what way inhabiting space could be restorative and whether and how architects could contribute to the healing on the construction world. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce today's lecture, Philip Morgan. Uh, Philip is a writer and researcher based between London and Berlin. He was a member of the uh, terraforming uh, cohort at the Strelka Institute of Media, Architecture and Design in uh, 2020, and is currently working on a book about food and climate change under the title Plaque Almanac. Uh, I invited uh, our students and I promised food as well, so it will be today's topic. <laughs> um, today's lecture, take a look at something directly and closely related to health, the food system, and ask how it could be healed. In order to feed ourselves, we cook the land, the atmosphere, the oceans, and other animals, and the earth is turn is cooking us. Named for the tradition um, of farmers, Almanacs that uh, stretches back to the dawn of agriculture and for the potential of the earth most fertile, dark synthetic soil, this open lecture will introduce back Black Almanac, as I said, the uh, book, what you, are, what you are at the moment, which is in process at the moment. A catalogue of steps to produce a viable food system by 2050. It asks when and why food culture became so reactionary, and how might we cook with flavors, landscapes, genes, machines, and buildings in order to expand a sustainable nutritious and disarable feast for a growing population at planetary scale. Black Almanac is growing index of urgent questions around food with uh, taught and surprising lessons for the present, a new hope for the future. And for those who are looking at our lecture in online, you could ask questions online as well. Here, as somebody said to me. <laughs> it was okay, yeah? <laughs> Please join me welcoming Philip Morgan. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. Yeah, we're going to talk about food, and I'd be interested to know whether you feel more hungry or less hungry by the time I finish talking, because uh, it might not exactly be what you're expecting. Uh, thank you so much, Andres. Thank you to Sile, to uh, Sim, and Lisu for uh, being so welcoming, and thank you to all the students whose amazing timber models I saw, well, card, soon-to-be timber models that I saw this afternoon. So yeah, I'm working on this book uh, with my colleague, Andrea, uh, with the kind of working, working title of Cooking Earth, this being part of a larger speculative project called Black Almanac. So Black Almanac is essentially uh, an index of ideas that asks what it would take to create a food system that is equitable, nutritious, carbon negative, and crucially, that is desirable by the year 2050. I'm not an architect, I'm not a chef, I'm not a food policy expert, uh, and neither is Andrea. Uh, we, we have backgrounds in, in journalism and reporting and research, and so, uh, you know, rather than endorsing homogenous solutions and saying, this is what we should do, uh, we're kind of leveraging that background to, uh, to kind of narrate and ask questions, collect data and speculate about the many mini revolutions in the food system that are already taking place and may or may not end up making a huge difference. 
In time, we hope this speculative object will become a living resource for stakeholders with a vested interest in the future of food, which, you know, even if you don't grow your own food, uh, you definitely eat it. So I think we all have, have an interest in this subject. So Black Almanac began last summer at the Strelka Institute of Media Architecture and Design in Moscow as part of the terraforming program, uh, which is led, co-directed by Benjamin Bratton and Nikolai Boyadyev. So what is terraforming? Maybe you heard this word before, or maybe you haven't. It's familiar to most people from science fiction. It's the idea that we might transform foreign planets or moons to make them habitable for humans. Uh, but instead, we're looking at Earth. We're looking at, we're, uh, we're looking at terraforming as it refers to both the terraforming that has taken place over the course of urbanization and to the terraforming that must now be planned and conducted as a planetary design initiative of the next century if true catastrophes are to be prevented. Recent work in archaeology tells us that even as far back as 12,000 years ago, all human societies had developed burning, cultivation, and species propagation to the degree that they had transformed three quarters of the Earth's land surface. This is before mechanized um, agriculture. In fact, lands that are often characterized as natural or untouched generally exhibit long histories of use. There's a great example that was pointed out uh, on the blog of the architecture writer Jeff Maynor, where he talks about the paintings by the Hudson River School, uh, attempting to depict a sort of unspoiled, primordial landscape, but in fact depicted uh, native indigenous American forest clearances, tree cultivation, you know, specific plant breeds that were, that were preferred in those uh, societies, and uh, basically land management. This is not, this is not uh, untouched, this is managed uh, territory. Um, it's no coincidence then that the, uh, the words for uh, map and menu are often the same in, uh, in a lot of languages, die Karte in German, la carte in French. Uh, we, we talk about knowing our way around the kitchen. And you can see in this sort of geospatial metaphor, uh, the kind of recursion between the, 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 the kind of domestic and the, uh, the larger geography uh, affected by the actions. In fact, you know, I mean, geographia is writing on the land, writing on the earth. We convert the biotic surface of the earth to release the energy that powers cities, social organizations, and other creatures. Uh, as was stated in my, my very kind introduction, we are cooking the land, we're cooking the atmosphere, we're cooking the oceans, and the earth, in turn, is cooking us. So agriculture has always been a force of terraforming, but it's not only food and landscapes that are the outcome of this process. For thousands of years, farmers collected rain tables, seed cycles, lunar charts in almanacs, portable databases of earth science that became sites for speculation about man's place within the cosmos. Almanacs were, in a sense, an early attempt at climate modeling. Pre-computational devices that encoded observation and abstraction in a systematic artificial intelligence that would evolve over the generations. So that's the almanac part. Why black? The most fertile soil on the planet is known as Chernozium. This is Russian for black earth. A couple of Russian speakers in the house, I think. Um, Chernozium can be found across the Eurasian wheat belt, which is essentially from Croatia into Siberia. Uh, it can be found in North America, stretching through the Great Plains into Canada. And it can be found in the Amazon basin, where it's known as terra preta. The origins of terra preta have been heavily debated with theories ranging from volcanic ash fall coming down from the Andes to ancient peat bogs. In reality, this nutrient rich, ultra resilient soil formed when indigenous Amazonians threw fish bones, manure, crockery shards, and other kitchen waste onto middens, which is middens are essentially trash heaps, <laughs> into middens outside their houses, cultivating patches of ground using charcoal, charcoal and re retaining them rather than moving on. So this is a strategy that only became possible with a kind of uh, sedentism. Soil itself is a living organism that needs to be fed. It has an architecture. It has an immune system. 
It has microbial workers, and it has a, dis a diet that's specific to its context. Despite what many had expected about Terra Preta, the soil is in fact anthropogenic. It's a collaborative synthesis between, both, uh, between humans and the land that benefits both, a kind of cosmic symbiosis that emerged from the domestic. In fact, it emerged from waste. Formed outside of kitchens, which themselves are a kind of everyday laboratory where spells are followed and alchemical experimentation is performed. Architect, um, agriculture, I keep mixing up architecture and agriculture. They're very similar words. <laughs> agriculture emerged on the alluvial plains of the Nile River Delta, a platform for urban innovation and a byword for the productive forces. In fact, keme is the ancient Egyptian word meaning black earth, a word which in turn became, became alchemia or alchemy in Arabic and ultimately chemistry. This agricultural uh, revolution, not the only one, there are in fact many in different places around the world, um, is pinpointed in, in kind of an, an anarchist mindset as being the moment when all the ills of, that plague modern life today began to cascade out of control. Not the beginning of a dream of plenty, but its conclusion. At the same time, the processes that produce our food today are responsible for one third of greenhouse gas emissions, 75% of deforestation, the degradation of half the planet's soil, and the majority of biodiversity loss, usually with land conversion. 1.3 billion tons of food are wasted every year. One in three people are malnour malnourished, while a further billion are obese. Three quarters of all the birds alive, as I speak these words, are farmed poultry. They're, they're chickens. Uh, in fact, the accumulation of chicken bones in landfill sites since 1950 is considered a large enough mark in the fossil record to mark the arrival of the Anthropocene. So there are a lot of reasons why we might want to see the food system changed, both personally and on a systems level. But it's not simply a question of, or not necessarily a question of, of reduction and asceticism. Of the 50,000 edible plants on Earth, just 15 provide 90% of our calories, which suggests to me that there's a lot of potential yet to be explored. So the book I'm putting together at the moment is divided into three sections, processing, cooking, and expanding. The first, cooking, oh, pro processing, sorry, refers to how we understand, manipulate, and experience food how we use chemistry to unlock its benefits and then dress it in the mantle of culture, and why it often feels as though the food system is stuck and that we're just going to go on eating the same things forever. The second section looks at cooking as a cosmic process, a practice which attends to the entanglement of life on Earth that pre-exists any human design of it. Um, it describes how we can also cook with technology, so we can need to expand this idea of cooking to mean a lot of different things. We can cook technology, we can cook laws, we can cook software, genetics, data, harnessing this entanglement to unleash energy and produce alternate arrangements. The final section asks, it begins in the city and asks how we might uh, rearrange the relays and flows between factory, farm, and canteen, uh, canteen and kitchen before asking what role the ancient non-human alchemists who inhabit every environment on the planet, including the insides of human bodies, might play in a terraforming project. So let's talk about processing. There's a lot to talk about in all of these chapters, but I'm just going to like pick, pick and mix a few uh, this evening. Ursula K. Le Guin, the famous American sci-fi writer, uh, define technology as the active human interface with the material world. What I find interesting about food is that it entirely demolishes this threshold. As the author Chad Lavin writes, when we eat, our bodies fuse with and become momentarily indistinguishable from the world that surrounds us. Objects that were once part of the external world are literally incorporated into the self and the space that separates the self from the world is collapsed. In ancient Sumer, home of the world's oldest written almanac, cereals were offered to the gods and stored in granaries at the exit from the temple. 
when the gods didn't eat, which generally what happened, the people did, forging a connection between rituals of ingestion and societal complexity and hierarchy that remains visible everywhere in contemporary food politics. Agriculture emerged in the so-called fertile crescent in today's contemporary Iraq uh, in response to difficult climactic shifts that made dry, preservable foods a necessity. And yet switching out staple crops today and destructive farming methods might in fact prove a lot more difficult than the transition to electric vehicles or renewable energy. The reasons for this are as complex as they are fundamental, and they stem from the basic neurophysiology of what happens when we eat. Neurogastronomy, that's the name of this emerging field. It's surprisingly, surprisingly understudied considering how, how essential it is. Taste and smell are our deepest and most primal senses. They are the mechanism by which we identify molecules in our environment, and all organisms do this. When humans chew, we loosen up aroma volatiles that sweep past sensory receptors in the mouth and retronasal passageway, activating spatial patterns in the brain's olfactory bulb as we breathe out. These signals combine with information from the other senses to form a neural cascade that passes through the emotion, learning, and memory processing structures in the brain before becoming conscious perception. All of this is to say that flavor, which is different from taste, tense is the, is the smell, flavor is something that we produce internally. It's subjective, it's contextual and contingent. It's as automatic as breathing, yet as intimate as dreaming. Humans have roughly a thousand olfactory genes, the largest family in the genome, as well, of nerve, as well as nerve responses through the entire body, but especially in the gut, where teeming colonies of microbes exert their, exert their quiet influence on your likes and dislikes. This neural rush represents the most modulated or cross-modal pathway in the brain, a powerful evolutionary incentive with the capacity to trigger both addiction and disgust, to define in and out group members and I'll let the vegetarians and the vegans fight at the end, um, and direct multi-billion dollar chunks of the global economy. Most of the food we see day to day is not intended for consumption. What we see instead are images on advertising and product packaging, on menus, magazines, and recipe blogs, all of which exert a powerful influence on Instagram, I suppose. You probably see a lot. By age five, most children have acquired a mental image of the farmyard and, and what happens there, or what supposedly happens there. This is drawn not from experience, but from cartoons, toys, and children's books, building up a semiotics of agrarian simplicity and limitless nature. The food system is manipulated much like food itself. Take the example of food photography, where meat is basted with motor oil so that it glistens when the flash goes off, or lard, is more likely, uh, sorry, ice cream is more likely to be lard or, or dyed wall filler, something that won't melt under the hot studio lights. Agrarian simulations exist to comfort and reassure us that food production will continue in a form that we recognize, even as news reports, nonfiction bestsellers, and Netflix exposés warn us of its ongoing perversion. As Rem Koolhaas's decade-long countryside report was at pains to express, a world formerly dictated by the seasons and the organization of agriculture is now a toxic mix of genetic experiment, industrial nostalgia, seasonal immigration, territorial buying sprees, so on and so forth. Massive subsidies, very important. In other words, it has become more volatile than the most accelerated city. Obfuscation, curation, and representation is embedded at every juncture of the food system. Some of you might remember the 2013 horse meat scandal in which beef lasagnas turned out to contain horse skin, sawdust, and other adulterants, appearing to confirm the epistemic breach between consumers and the food that they eat. Yet the response to this was not a demand for greater insight into a food system successfully feeding a large and increasingly larger population. Um, it was instead a kind of, it, it, it produced a kind of deepening of, of denial. We just, we looked forward to being able to not think about supply chains again. And then, surprise, now we're thinking about them again. So many people believe that it is 
cultural or re an evolutionary neophobia, which neophobia is the official word for a suspicion of unfamiliar tastes, textures, experiences, and sensations, that is the primary obstacle emerging food cultures must overcome. But there is a legal and economic barrier too. Governments worldwide spend roughly a billion dollars of public money every day to over-incentivize land-hungry, emissions-intensive, and climate-vulnerable farming. That figure rises to 700 billion every year when non-direct subsidies for biofuels, crop insurance, land clearance, drainage, and dams are included. It is these zombie payments that dictate the crop mix that farmers grow, not the terroir, not their experience, not their skills or preferences, and in fact, very rarely consumer preference, in fact, and definitely not nutritional value. The political reasons for this are complex, but the chemical calculus is not. Subsidies that target emissions-intensive commodities like meat, dairy, and rice increase the rate of overall emissions. Subsidies that target adverse land use changes, as in the case of cattle, soy, and palm oil, reduce in high, uh, produce higher emissions. Tariff barriers that restrict production in more efficient parts of the world currently also produce higher emissions. And this is an important note. Local is not necessarily the same thing as sustainable. The decision to eat locally, regionally, or nationally, that is to embrace a locavore diet, bit of a buzzword, locavore, I don't think I hear it quite so much anymore, but it's out there, would reduce greenhouse gas emissions only if transport accounted for an appreciable share of the emissions generated by food. In fact, in the majority of cases, it doesn't. Multiple studies put the proportion of emissions generated by transport at just 5 to 6% of food's overall total. With beef, it's just 0.5%, and the figure is very similar for coffee and wheat. Cooking. The food system we have is often considered too cumbersome to fix. But food cultures themselves are neither fixed nor finite. New dishes, varieties, recipes, breeds, and behaviors have been created, scattered, transformed, and forgotten over time. Consider the lobster. For decades, this bottom-feeding crustacean was used exclusively as fertilizer and animal feed. It was even regulated, or so, I'm not sure if it's an urban legend, but <laughs> it was even regulated against in the Northeast US uh, so that prisoners wouldn't be fed it too often because it would just be too cruel to feed them, feed them all this lobster. Today, of course, the lobster has taken a bit of a reverse in status. It has become a symbol of excess, the centerpiece of grills, thermidors, cultural festivals, and a major economic asset in the coastal regions where it is farmed. It took little over a decade for Japanese favorites such as raw eel, seaweed, tofu, and matcha to make their way into the global mainstream, a shift driven not by necessity, but by desire. In each case, foods needed to be discovered. Edibility is not innate in things. Up to 2,000 species of insect are known to be edible and form a major uh, source of protein in Asia, Africa, and South America. Yet in the rich West, the disgust reflex that once served an important evolutionary function has contaminated an entire category of edible creatures through their association with waste and decay. And it is this, this contamination that the lobster and crayfish and others have somehow managed to escape. It's worth asking. Could lobster and sushi provide a historic precedent for fermented proteins, algae, lava fat, or any other perennially harvested, high efficiency, and nutrient-rich ingredient? Part of the twisted genius of the existing food system is the way that it takes raw materials it is too cumbersome to eliminate, corn and soy being the most obvious example, to create a wide array of distinct forms. In fact, whether you know it or not, Westerners are already eating bugs in the form of carmine, also known as Crimson Lake or E120 in the EU. These are euphemisms that refer to the cactus-dwelling cochineal of South America, which you will probably find in your cakes, sodas, yogurts, and lipsticks. In his unfinished utopian novel, New Atlantis, published posthumously in 1626, the British philosopher and statesman Sir Francis Bacon depicted a mythical island with an experimental garden 
where vegetables were grafted and inoculated in the hope that they would one day end hunger and ultimately vanquish death. We make by art in the same orchards and gardens trees and flowers to come much earlier or later than their seasons, explains the head of the island. We make them also by art greater much than their nature and their fruit greater and sweeter and of different taste, smeller, smell, color, and figure. Planetary thinking leads us towards the possibilities opened by the full mobilization of energy and matter. In this, it is neither local nor global, as it seeks not to restrict intervention according to a predetermined boundary, nor does it encourage the flattening of processes into the brand and brittle web of globalization. Bacon made quite clear, uh, quite clear that it was artisans, not philosophers, who had fostered the pivotal breakthroughs of his era, the compass, the printer, gunpowder. Cooking, when applied to meat or remote sensing, whatever the case may be, carries with it both risk and reward. It means embracing the strange and as yet untested in technology and governance as much as in broths, smoothies, and stews. For all the unexpected mixtures and inventions, food remains plagued by rigid binaries and categorical redundancies that inhibit its expansion. One of those is natural and artificial, which to any chemist is essentially a meaningless dichotomy. To complicate this picture, let's look for a second at vanilla, probably the most popular flavor on the planet, used in beverages, desserts, perfumes, cleaning products, and livestock feed. Vanilla was first synthesized in 1874 by two German chemists who deduced the chemical structure of the vanilla bean and isolated a near-perfect analog in pine bark. So there is no difference between what we call synthetic vanillin, ah, yeah, we call it vanillin, vanillin when it's found outside of the vanilla bean, but it's the same thing. Uh, there's no difference when we, uh, w w between what we call a synthetic vanillin uh, and the substance that emerges uh, a substance when it emerges outside the bean. Sorry, I'm going to mix it up. It's the process that determines whether it is labeled natural or artificial. Aside from vanilla beans, vanillin can be extracted from wood pulp, from cow manure, from rice, from wine barrels, uh, and the gooey secretions that line the anuses of North American and European beavers. This is why I thought you might not be hungry, so... But it, it's, it's how it happens, and it's natural. <laughs> so today, actually, 85% of the vanillin that is used in the food industry uh, is, is synthesized through a petrochem from petrochemical precursors, guaiacol and glyoxylic acid. This synthesis, unlikely as it sounds, is the least intensive way to produce vanillin. And yet, of course, this uh, pervasive fear of chemicals has given rise to a new process of extracting natural vanillin from fermented yeast aided by genetically engineered microbes. Once the vanillin has been produced, the microbes have annihilated themselves, enabling manufacturers to avoid the scarlet letter that is GMO on their packaging. Most GMO debates focus on the perceived risk to human health rather than on the way that they tilt the playing field against smaller farmers and the communities they feed. The GMO discourse obscures patent, the patenting of plant genes as the intellectual property of a handful of multinational corporations. After the massive merger of Dow DuPont and Monsanto Bayer, only four market leaders now control almost 40% of the patents, patents uh, granted by the EU. Indeed, the greater evil may in fact not be GMO, but IP which is not treated as an incentive for nutrition or food security in the way that far farming subsidies are, but like any other technology, where seeds can be patented as utilities and the phrase Propriet proprietary microbes is spoken without irony. By 2025, we will have more data on genomics than we have on astronomy. The resulting exabytes of data are already often housed in open public databases but they're accessible only to companies that can afford the costly bioinformatic systems required to tap into their potential value. The blanket ban on GMO stuff in the EU, which now includes gene editing using CRISPR, 
where the changes made are essentially indistinguishable from the mutations that are happening constantly uh, in nature anyway, has, has had the sort of counterintuitive effect of maintaining patent market share by, on behalf of big ag uh, while hiding this kind of IP injustice within the contemporary food system. And just so you know what this is, uh, this is actually from uh, a system developed in Indonesia where they're using machine vision to monitor the behavior of fish so that they can accurately uh, spread feed within the, 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 aqua, um, the aquaculture system. So, you know, precision is really uh, important for existing farming as well as, you know, developing new systems at the same time. And it's, it's, it just looks like a bucket and it sits on the edge of the pond. It's very cool. So, to wrap up, in 1932, a children's book was published called A Cook for the Whole City. Uh, this was published in Moscow in the Soviet Union to explain the workings of the factory kitchen. After the Russian Revolution, apartments were built kitchen-free with the stated aim of liberating families and women in particular from the burden of what they called bourgeois household economy. Instead, Whole neighborhoods were to eat in canteens, and a few of them were constructed. This is one from above in a hammer and sickle formation. I think it's really quite astonishing. Um, whole neighborhoods were to eat in canteens, a public feeding typology in which mass production and communal dining were combined to balance nutrition apportioned to the gram by Soviet dietitians with the volatile surpluses and deficits of the planned economy. Flavors were evaluated at the Politburo level. Stalin himself selected which candies should be put into production, and the rest was carried out by the dogged micromanager, trade minister, Anstaz Mikoyan, whose personal preferences were engineered to fit a country the size of half the world. That is the, that is the power of, of our likes and dislikes, I would say, and this is him eating a taco on one of his trips to America. <laughs> uh, as we continue to fill our almanac, we are prompted to ask, and perhaps some of my my new architect friends here can help me out with this one. What might a new factory kitchen include if it were built around a concept of planetary cuisine? Fast food is often criticized, but slow food cannot scale to meet the requirements of a booming population. Movements like molecular gastronomy maximize hedonic pleasure at the expense of nourishment. And yet the design of food for space travel, another interesting site for culinary innovation, has revealed an archive of nourishment without desire. A contemporary factory kitchen would subvert the impasse between factory farming and cessational family kitchens as a design platform capable of operating across a variety of scales. It would not be a bubble or a closed system of knowledge and materials, but an interchange that patches into a planetary food ecology with automation, autonomy, land reformation, and experimentation at its heart. In fact, the point of urban scale automation simply should be to remove the onus on individuals to solve these sort of large, large, large questions, large problems. And you know, most of the food discourse, it is entirely reliant on you know, uh, ethical consumerism and, and personal choice. But I think this misses a lot of the, the conversation out, a lot of the problem. Um, instead, it rests on an infrastructure that can swap out inputs as required in a read-write system oriented around regenerative agriculture, carbon sequestration, closing waste loops, so on and so forth. Instead of humans deboning chickens and pulling vegetables from the frozen ground at 5 a.m., the user's role should be to employ their creative capacities, as we have throughout history, to seek out the tastiest, broadest flavor spectrum possible, and to invent new combinations that the advantages of genomic research, food as medicine, and agricultural sensing make possible. So when the Voyager 1 and 2 space probes left Earth in 1977, their payload included a golden record that contained images of people eating and farming, raising a behavior that might seem banal and everyday to one of cosmic and perhaps even species-defining scope. Depictions of food in space tend towards legibility and orderliness, an attempt to reduce alienation in a place that is alien by default. And yet an agriculture beyond Earth, or at least maybe in its future, 
would not be ob obligated to retain the smooth geometry associated with extensive crop cultivation and domesticated cattle. Instead of regularity and repetition, it might be altogether messier. Cooking changed the course of our evolution, both social and biological, enabling us to master the transforma uh, transformative synthesis on which chemistry is based. Yet for all our striving, we are always entangled with the world around us, an entanglement that pre-exists and resists our will to subdue it according to our semiotic projections. Food is not only for us. Food has a life of its own. Humans account for just 0.01% of Earth's biomatter, and yet even within that 0.01% live enormous colonies inhabited by many billions of microorganisms in the hair, in the throat, in the stomach, on the skin. These ancient invaders predate us by a significant margin, uh, and, make, and yet they make our metabolism, our, our energy, our immune health, and other regulation possible. The reason I say this is to, to make clear that food is never whole, and neither are we. There is no barrier between humans and nature. There is no outside from which we are prohibited. Instead, there is a garden of interdependent aliens, and it is the recognition of this alienation that will be crucial in making Earth a second home. Thank you. <laughs> it's a time for questions and discussion. So uh, I'm open the Q&A session. I guess we have a microphone as well. I can ask first without the microphone. So Philip, what do you expect us to do, us architects? What should we, like, how? Okay. Yeah, what are your expectations on on architects or or the built environment that we are designing? Are we do we need to really understand and restructure the the food chain or how it's been produced? I think as a business spe one? specialist, right? I mean, not everyone is an expert in in sort of farming, and they're not they're not. I mean, we, the you know. My point is that farmers are the first terraformers, and they, they probably can tell you what they need and what they want in kind of interesting way, but mm. you will be familiar with the typology of fast food restaurants, for example, or you know, uh, dining scenarios. There's so many different ways to do it. And you know, so many of the propositions for food are quite anti-technology, and they're actually anti-materials in general. They're, 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 they're garden-focused, and they're, they're like allotment kind of uh, models. But I think like the technology of what fast food companies do, for example, is worth is worth interrogating, even if the food is is trash at this point. Like there's no reason why it couldn't be put to better uh, to better use. Um, I also think you know uh, we talked a lot about it this afternoon. Like the kitchen is really suspect and, and up for uh, up for renewal. Mm -hmm. The I mean everything has come up for renewal in the last two years. I feel like and and the kitchen, you know, it's important to think of it. Um, as a sort of historical document, you know, when did things that are in a contemporary kitchen uh, sort of go there? And, and do we need like one of everything in this kind of domestic, repetitive, like suburban model? You know, what kind of infrastructure can be shared? What would be gained by that? You know, there's like all the experimental stuff like, you know, algae bioreactors and like, you know, there's like the sci-fi kind of side of things. And mm -hmm. To be clear, I'm very pro sci-fi being involved in the food system, but I, I think that there's also, you know, like uh, we talked about a big pizza oven that everybody has in the backyard earlier today. I mean, there's there's kind of, uh, there's a reason why some things are, are able to be reproduced indoors and there's, you know, reasons why, why you get fried food on the street, right? Because it's dangerous. You don't want to burn down your house. So there's these kinds of uh, kind of thinking, I think, you know, to help, to help restructure uh, the domestic and then, you know, the way that food flows around the city is is also completely changing. I mean, it's different now to five years ago. But why do you think that the Soviet uh, proposal of canteens and no kitchen uh, indoors uh, or in apartment didn't work out? <laughs> um, or did because they have a civil war is why it have, didn't work out. But, 
I, um, <laughs> I mean, I also don't, I'm not, uh, I'm not necessarily sure that everybody wants to cook together. <laughs> I hate people cooking with me. I like, you know, I'm that, I like when people say, do you want help? I said, no, sit down in the other room, please. <laughs> um, and I think the same thing was, was true there for sure. Just, <laughs> on top of all the other problems that people had there, the stress of trying to like, you know, cook in a really, in a really uh, sort of aesthetically pleasing way. I mean, that's, we were talking earlier about um, open kitchens in restaurants. And you know, the interesting thing in, in that is that you have the, the finishing touches applied in an open kitchen in a restaurant, but there's always a second kitchen behind, which is where you do the, the dirty stuff. It's where you, you know, peel the potatoes and like the waste goes out and the under packaging comes off and all these kinds of things it's only the heroic moments of like applying the the final touches and making that you know do the drizzles of like juice that suggests like you're in an expensive restaurant this all happens in the front um so yeah i i don't think that uh to have a kind of necessarily big and open shape uh kitchen or even canteen is necessarily like the way it has to go. But what I do think is, is, is happening already is you have a, sh a kind of a move towards sharing certain, certain infrastructure. Um, and it doesn't necessarily have to be a low tech version of that. You know, that there's like, there are communal ki kitchens and, you know, places where people leave food to share in neighborhoods and stuff like that. But I think this can be um, with the kind of advantages of digital platforms, this can actually be expanded a lot further. Hi. Hi. So the food system is extremely complex, right? There are very many stakeholders. Uh, there are all kinds of processes, environmental, cultural, scientific, and so on. And you are kind of trying to describe it to the wider audience, right? Uh, I am wondering how, how far can you go by making the wider audience understand the complexity uh, do you, at the moment, you're mostly describing the various aspects of it, right? But can you reach the systemic understanding of the whole complexity? Yeah, it's... So one problem is trying to make... Uh, or not make, but, like, trying to make agriculture sort of farming interesting. Like, you know, like, people quit farming as soon as they have the chance. That's, like, the historical trend, you know? I understand to some degree that... It's like thinking about the economy, you know, like it's it's too complicated to kind of get your to get your head around. But I think that the the kind of cold real of it all is that the the most damaging sort of uh, if we're talking purely about climate change, like the most the most damaging aspect of, of the way that we we do agriculture now, it is just it's land conversion. You know, we focus so much on distance of of of, uh, of the food miles and, and things like this, and we talk and you know policy people talk about food sheds like watersheds. You know, the distance from in which your your food comes, and there are, there are sort of social reasons why local food is kind of better in that regard. But the problem is that we are still turning forests into pasture, and this is continuing. This hasn't slowed down at all, and. Uh, so not only are there kind of you know experimental sort of food food production methods, but I'm uh, I mean I'm actually just making things more complicated now, aren't I? They're quite the opposite of what your your point was about. But you know I think it's just a, any kind of way that you can you can cut through all of the the kind of cultural symbolic uh, kind of stuff and just say like this is actually it's a complicated system, but it's a it's a straightforward dilemma. We're converting too much land. And we need to think about how we do that differently and sort of moves towards, you know, organic and, and, and regenerative and all these things. Yes, for certain things, but no, for, for not for others, because if you are converting more land domestically, it, it inevitably, it's a bit like recently with the gas prices, right? Like they all went up because, you know, and, and Germany said, oh, it wasn't windy. So, you know, th this is in energy terms, you know, this is the same thing with food. Uh, what usually happens, and there's a lot of papers on this, I'm, I mean, I've been reading about it, it's, um, is that when, when countries go sort of, when rich countries go more towards like local, organic, whatever, the shortfall is inevitably made up from overseas. And so the continuation of, of, uh, of, of, of land conversion goes on. There, but there are so many other reasons why that happens as well. I mean, in South America, you know, where the Amazon comes down, it's, bec it's often it's because uh, the, um, 
the cattle businesses are being used to launder money. I mean, there's lots of different reasons, and it is very, very complicated, and, and it's not a one-size-fit-all solution. This is why I think I would say that we, we like the idea of an almanac, because you can, you can kind of chop it up a little bit. Um, but yeah, I mean, I don't know if I'm answering your question. It's sort of about communication of what's behind the veil, right? This, this stuff that we don't see. I mean, we all see food, but we don't see food production, generally speaking. Yeah, I'm just worried a bit that uh, it might, for the general audience, happen that they they become aware of one particular issue and then this becomes the topic and this in turn causes all the next problems in the uh, surrounding it. Like, yeah, and it, I mean, it, it tends to happen that way, right? Yeah. Like you see, uh, we went from kind of greenwashing to carbon washing. I don't know if you've noticed, but all the products now are starting to talk about their carbon uh, cost or how much carbon they may or may not have sequestered. And it just all seems like nonsense to me. Like it seems like marketing and that's not what you want. But what you do want is, is great, greater visibility over the process. I mean, I, I do think that's important and there are technological solutions for, for this, but there's also just like better food labeling. You know, food labeling is, is all, it's hocus, it's astrology, a lot of it. I mean, even the nutritional label, which you think of as being the kind of most scientifically based uh, part of it, it's only a very partial view of, of certain, you know, macronutrients that we've all become obsessed about at various points. And often for, you know, there's a lot of, a lot unknown in that, but I think, you know, yeah, land conversion, water use, these are all kinds of things that you might actually want to get on the, on the label rather than necessarily obsessing about the country of origin. Thanks. Thank you. Hi. Uh, Hi. <clears throat> so we talk a lot about terraforms and terrestrial agriculture, but with the climate change continuing and the sea level rising, being already 70% of the world, what are the possibilities to produce food and making sea agriculture uh, that is sustainable and using food waste to make nutritious sea soil, as mentioned before, with terraforms. So how to terraform the ocean? <laughs> or not? Well, like, I don't know, like using uh, like food waste, as you mentioned before, in like terraform, like yeah. you would like produce better soil, uh, also in like sea agric agriculture. Yeah. Well, the advantage of the sea is that it hasn't been terraformed in the way that the land has. And so to some degree, we have the opportunity to not make the same mistakes by expanding further into, into territory that kind of doesn't, um, doesn't need it. Um, I mean, yeah, thinking about like, I mean, there are sort of, you can do aquaculture on land. There's aquaponic systems, you know, I'm sure this is maybe what you're alluding to where the, the kind of uh, waste uh, from plants that you're growing, um, waste from uh, fish, sorry, that are at the top of the system are fertilizing uh, plants that are growing underneath. Apparently, Kanye has this system in his uh, in his farm in Wyoming, um, but, but um, yeah, I mean, and also actually, fish, bit of a pivot, but just let me roll with it for a second. I mean, fish is the most advanced cell culture systems that kind of exist because the so this is you know growing, growing meat, growing growing anything that originates in cells in bioreactors um, or in huge tanks essentially. Um, and fish is the most advanced sort of system with this because the fish uh, texture is much more easy to, to replicate. Though whenever we get onto this question, you have this, this subject of, uh, of copying and, and mimetic representation and like repetition. I, I always get really bored by the, I will come back to the oceans. I always get really bored when people start talking about like, does it actually taste like a real steak or whatever because these technologies are tools. There's no reason that you should use it to make something that we already have. Like, yeah, the 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 kind of climate advantage. I mean, I'm I'm all for it. I, I mean, if we could grow meat, people aren't going to give up eating meat. I don't think it, if it hasn't happened by now. Um, so yeah, we can grow things uh, in a tank. But what else could we do? What weird forms could we could we create? Um, yeah, I don't really have anything that's coming to mind immediately about the oceans, but uh, like, they, do, they do need to be taken care of as well. Like I meant like right now, like still like, as you said, people are going to continue eating meat. So they're going to continue eating fish and fish is still going to be caught from the ocean. And right now, a lot of this like uh, mass scale uh, fish uh, 
like industries where they catch fish is like uh, polluting also the ocean and kind of like taking like the soil from the ocean and destroying it because mm -hmm. they like go like from beneath like using like the, the trawlers yeah, yeah yeah like i mean like maybe like how to overcome those problems yeah yeah i don't have the technology per se um at my fingertips but i think that they're i don't know i'm trying to think what proposals i've heard about with fish yeah I don't know, I'll come back to you. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, anyway. All right, thanks. Yeah, no worries. Uh, so, yeah, uh, yeah my, the, the question is a bit fragmented in the head, but I'll, I'll just uh, spill it over anyway. Uh, I, in, 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 in one, one point in, in the lecture, you, you sort of expanded a little bit on uh, this desire and need, like the dichotomy between uh, doing something that you need and doing something that you desire. And then after that, you said something about flavors, like uh, what sort of role that they are playing, like all these taste enhancers and, and just adding up flavor, which is you know not primarily for the need, but this sort of also adds up to the consumption cycle of this entire chain. So do, do you think that there's this, this politics of uh, ha adding up flavors to certain things or is it is it like also playing like a, a significant role in terraforming just this concept of flavoring yeah oh, for sure i mean we yeah we spoke to a a flavorist and this has got to be one of the most sort of niche but also amazing jobs that you can do so flavorists are um, they're chemical engineers but they're extremely low tech in the sense that their nose and their memory are completely essential to what they do. You have to train for seven years to become a, fl a flavorist minimum. It's below being an architect. And, uh, and you, um, you need to establish, the reason for that is you need to establish a language that is applicable to the sense of flavor um, so that you can work within industry and, and with colleagues and so on. You know. Generally speaking, the work is made quite dull for the reasons I've already kind of expressed. You have this sort of, this kind of loop, uh, this kind of uh, flavor loop, if you like, where you have focus groups who seek out the same answers and then you have farming subsidies which produce the same, same products and you have you know, huge centralized agricultural companies uh, that are very, very slow and difficult to change. And so, you know, usually a flavorist is asked to create the same flavor that, you know, uh, but in a new product, which is less exciting. But they also have uh, kind of, what do they call them, white space days where they're allowed to say, oh, what does, um, you know, disappointment taste like? And then they get to create it, uh, which, you know, I think is really, really exciting. And part of the reason I was talking about the, the olfactory genes is that I think that's been, they used to, Scientists used to believe that we could sense only, I don't know, it was less than a million different, uh, it's a bit like the, you know, the, 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 the color spectrum, we could only sense uh, less than a million different uh, flavors, but actually it's been, been disproven and it's something closer to a billion. And yet we're only, we're only experiencing a tiny, tiny flat, uh, fractor, uh, fraction of that. And I think um, you know, desire as a whole has to be an integral part of this process, but this, this, these things I described, like the advent of sushi, I mean, if you ask your parents or grandparents, like, what, how would they have felt about, like, uh, you know, eating uh, raw flounder or seaweed or, I mean, it depends where you're from, right? Like, you know, there's, like, I often think, like, so in the UK, we eat, like, pig's blood and, like, moldy, moldy blue cheese, and we have, like, a seaweed thing called lava bread in Wales. Like, th there's always uh, things that are kind of niche, and what's interesting is how that, pro how that, um, food kind of uh, is adopted elsewhere you know there was like a, there was a study there's a journal called frontiers in nation uh, in nature and they did a a study with insect chocolates mealworm chocolates and they told one group of people you should eat these chocolates because uh they're good for the environment and there was another group of people and they said uh you should eat these chocolates because it'll make you really sexy and cool and the people who were told they were going to be sexy and cool were loving the chocolates, or at least proportionally much more interested in eating them than the ones who were told about the climate. I don't really necessarily think that uh, we can shame people into eating food that is, you know, 
is just good for the system. I think there also has to be this uh, this demand pull. They have to they have to want it. Uh, you know, so that's where the creativity and the cooking comes in. Basically, uh, I think that we are fundamentally capable of doing this. We experiment. We make tasty stuff. Um, we need more of that built into the technological systems. I would argue, um, in order to uh, in order to break out of this loop, this kind of static capitalist realism of food. Like, you know, there's pizzas and then there's like gentrified pizzas and then there's Michelin starred pizzas. And that seems to be all of your options at the moment. Nothing against pizzas. <laughs> Philip, I have one question, which is more like a question of architect. Um, <clears throat> It's about a uh, room which we call kitchen, which has been uh, very rapidly, has been changed during the last century and last 20 years, starting with the room with servant and, mm. and then uh, the uh, room where every step were calculated, or the Rushovka's uh, kitchen where the idea was go to, to the milk bar, uh, till nowadays where we are talking like about the neoliberal kitchen which is open uh, with yeah. the island. And <laughs> um, <laughs> and how you see what is the next typology of kitchen where you could cook yourself? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it's a good question. Um, and this is, I mean, this is ultimately the reason for the, the factory kitchen is uh, as a kind of historical example is because I'm not really convinced that this this kind of relay of like suburban domestic with an island or not uh it, you know and then the warehouse which is the supermarket and then whatever's beyond that we don't necessarily know i mean i think that there are exciting uh you know future it's funny that the, the i mean the microwave i'm thinking about like the most kind of recent new uh, tools i mean the, the microwave the nutribullet this kind of thing i mean there's there's all kinds of like uh consumer things, but I'm interested in sort of a bigger scale, I suppose, you know, like we were looking at these apartment blocks this afternoon and it's like, you know, mm -hmm. is it, I, I'm not convinced that, you know, we all need to be cooking our own, uh, growing our own tomatoes that you, you can if you want. Uh, it's kind of like, you know, it's fun to go camping, but we don't always want to live in a tent, right? Like you don't want to do it every day. It's, it's not necessarily practical, but I do think that there's kind of, uh, there's some interesting uh, technological applications and and like uh, you know bioreactors and um, and and cell cultures and things they they could kind of they could kind of come into it. I'm trying to think what would be my idea like but personally what would be my ideal reformation of the kitchen? I mean I just wouldn't want anyone else in it like no islands like you know just just me um, alone in it. And I mean social organization is shifting so much so. We need kitchens that are appropriate for different kinds of people with different kinds of needs. Um, we also um, we also uh, might want to think about um, yeah. I mean, so there already are a lot of weird kitchens around us, right? Like there's this phenomenon of ghost kitchens, and which you probably heard about. They're kitchens that are 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 used by a a multitude of different people so that, uh, you know, for delivery only, generally speaking. Um, but the interesting thing that's to me about those is that there was already a lot of shared kitchens or not shared, but like large infrastructure size kind of kitchens around. Probably there's one somewhere close to me at this point, you know, when the, when the pandemic started, um, it made really clear, you know, that there's public offices, um, there's uh, schools, you know, all these places that have kitchens that weren't being used. And this is, something needs to be corrected here because the ghost kitchens were being used, but all of these public infrastructure, all of these kitchens that supposedly were there for a kind of social purpose were not being used. So I think, you know, there's, there's, something, uh, there's something there as well. I think you should have the option, basically. I mean, if you, if you want to cook at home as an individual, that's, that's amazing. And, and, you know, and it's important to recognize that all the complexity of like the, the kind of, you know, eight course, like, you know, luxurious kind of meal is wonderful, but also sometimes you just wanna, you wanna grab something and go. Sometimes you wanna cater. I don't know, I think it's about having access to different, different, uh, 
different um, types of kitchen. And to be honest, a lot of them already exist, right? And, and retrofitting them with you know platforms that make it possible to book them and you know uh, and and, and host in so, it, someone in your kitchen and use somebody else's kitchen. I think these kinds of things are probably around the corner. Bit of a convoluted answer. Sorry. I, I mean, I haven't. I'm not an architect. I haven't designed my own kitchen yet, but. Uh, I'll hire, I'll hire someone who knows what they're doing to, to, to make mine. <laughs> Let's see. Thank you. If we have no online questions, then thank you so much. Philip Morgan. Thank you.